the rush. The sooner we get there, the quicker we gotta bust apart. Cut that out. Get over where you belong. It's just what I'm doing. jail. Margo P. and Margo D. here. Uh, we just wanted to do a little uh, trigger warning at the top of the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just doing some editing. We were talking off the air about Kim Kardashian and Kanye West and what's going on in the culture right now. And we were just saying operas are very grisly, and this is kind of a grisly story. It's a story that we would say has domestic violence. The character is stalking another character. It's an intense subject. And if that is upsetting for you, maybe this isn't the episode for you. We're not going to be really talking a lot about choreography or costumes as much as the themes. Yeah, it's something that exists in all the versions of this story, including the source material. So it's um, it's definitely part of this conversation. So we just wanted to warn you ahead of time. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host, Marco D. of Brooklyn Fitchick. Hi, everyone. We are in the middle of Musical March. Mm-hmm. Musical March marches on and we've had so much fun talking about musicals. This is the second year we've done this and... The reason it's been so fun is because our listeners have had such amazing suggestions for us to do. And um, although we've been playing a little fast and loose with the term book lately, Mm -hmm. today we are truly doing a book to... um, to a movie adaptation, if you will. We'll, we'll get into the uh, the ins and outs of Carmen Jones in a little bit here. But if you are brand new to book versus movie, yes, this is a podcast where we read books and then we watch the movie. We try to discuss, see what we think. You can join in on the conversation with us and other listeners of this podcast in a couple of different places. Yes, we do have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like it. We also have a private Facebook group. A lot of people like to hang out in the group. And we really just created a space where people just talk about books and movies. It's pretty wonderful. You don't think you can do that on Facebook, but it is possible. We've done it. So just go type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group and ask to join. We're on Twitter and Instagram, Book versus Movie. You spelled it out. You can also send suggestions there. We have a basic email, Book versus Movie Podcast. Spell it all out at gmail.com. We ask that the source material will be something that we could pretty easily get our hands on, either Kindle or the Libby app, or we get a a quickie paperback we can get through Amazon. The movie has to be streaming somewhere. We can't have a jacked up YouTube version or something that's only available on VHS because we don't have Unless it's Harper Valley PTA. Unless it's Harper (laughs) Valley PTA and includes the commercials from the time. That is a go, but because uh, we had a re- somebody requested uh, Sweet Charity, but it's missing the Hey Big Spenders, and I'm like, I can't do it without oh, Hey Big Spenders. I Spender. know you so kind of have to have the whole thing complete. Yeah, so maybe next year we'll definitely put that on the list for next year. But just sort of keep that in mind. And if you really enjoy the show and you would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can support us on Patreon. I'd like to say hello and thank you to Dee Fernandez for joining our group. We have been doing the show for about eight years. We're putting up all the episodes previous to March of 2021, 2020, excuse me. All that's going up there. There's over 80 episodes we've recently added to the Facebook, I'm sorry, the Patreon page. In Cold Blood, The Birds, Shawshank Redemption, and Rocket Man. All of those are books and movies we've covered and we loved. They're on the Patreon page. We have a couple of very affordable options. We're also going to start with April, a yearly 
one. So you just do the donation that one time, boom, you're good for 12 months. So if you would like to do that, that's the way to do it. It's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thanks very much. And yeah, today we're going to be talking about Carmen Jones adapted from now. Okay, help me understand the the progression of this. So we have yeah, we the should... movie that we're talking about with Dorothy Dandridge and, and Harry Belafonte, right. which is adapted from a stage a version of Carmen Jones. Is that correct? Of, of Oscar Hammerstein II did a staging of it, which is based on the opera. Opera, which, okay. Which was by... George Bizet. Bizet, thank you. But the book was originally by Prosper Merimé. And yes, so the opera is based on a book. Right. By so, another Frenchman. Right. We should say now yeah. that we're not experts on opera. <laughs> on any of these things. <laughs> on any of these things, so we're going <laughs> to do the best that we possibly can. But that's what we do. We just figure out what the, where, you know, the etymology, so to speak. Where did this all come from? What is the source? Where did this, the origin story of Carmen, where did this actually come from? Which it turns out it came from a really interesting person. And it's a, I really enjoyed learning yeah. about him oh my goodness me too what an interesting character and i had never read i um, of course i've seen this opera many times there are so many adaptations of carmen it's one of those stories that gets done again and again and again but i know i never knew anything about the original author and i certainly had never read the novella let's get into it let's let's talk about mr um is it how do you pronounce this i, I believe so prosper so merime with french at my high school french that's what i believe it is prosper merime okay. he was born september in 1803 in paris france he's a, a frenchman he also was such an he his parents were both artists he was a writer he was someone who was also uh, an expert on on geography on historical monuments he was an, uh, he's Fought for liberal causes. He was friends with people like Victor Hugo. He was a writer, but he also he had this job of of creative dedicating spaces around France to be national, basically monuments that need to be preserved. One of them being Carcassonne, which is this medieval town that I stayed in when I was in France the last time. It's like one of my favorite places in the world. I was so excited. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's the Musée National de Moyen-Âge in Paris. That was him. He had, uh, he was never married. He, uh, oh, he's, by the way, considered one of the first people to be successful with the short story slash novella. And he was doing that while he was also like, he was having affairs with women, traveling around uh, France and uh, Spain. He also, by the way, was into Russian, so he taught himself Russian. Very intelligent man. And just really quite something. And didn't he marry like a countess or something like that? No, he never got married, but he had several affairs. And one of them was with a countess, and it was very much back and forth. He also was in love with the artist George Sand, which is a pen name for a woman, in case you're wondering. But they had a friendship that went on for a long time that turned romantic. George Sand told a friend of hers, yeah, I got with Merrimé last night. It wasn't very good. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> But he was fascinated with what was called Romani culture. And it's basically what was happening in Europe as people were now traveling and what makes you a French person versus a Spanish person versus a Romanian person versus whatever. Andalusian, um, there, there's Basque, there's all these different ideas. So this is mid-19th century that he's writing about. And his subject is a woman, and the woman is... You know, as Hollow Notes would say, a man eater. Carmen is just right. Wow. Whoa, whoa, here she comes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was written as a series of stories. It's, a, it's maybe 50 pages, and we were just talking off the air. It's available on the Libby app. I think it's for free on Amazon. Um, it's, it's, very easy to get and very quick read. It starts with a very, it's the poet Pal Pilatus, Pilatus, I'm so sorry. It's, it's, this is how it starts. Every woman turns sour, twice she has her hour. One is in bed, the other is dead. And that's kind of the story we get about Carmen yeah. in this. <laughs> it sets the tone. Yes. <laughs> it comes out in 
1845. He does pretty well with it. The opera doesn't happen until after his death, so he doesn't get to see what happens to her. But in Seville, Spain, there's a all over Spain. My sister says you could see signs of Carmen. It's such a it's she's a big symbol. Oh, it's a big like a folk figure, right? Yeah, right. She's a folk figure, so there, there's that element as well. But should we start talking about the story? Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting because there's a character that's not in any of the adaptations, which is our it's his narrator. narrator. Mm-hmm. It's this scholar, I think, who's traveling Spain, looking. I don't remember where he if he is Spanish, but anyway, our narrator is traveling. No, I think he's not because he's got a Spanish guide with him, huh? Right. So he's he's traveling with this guide looking up like ancient battle sites, like ancient Roman battle sites or medieval, I can't remember which, in Spain. And they're traveling and he comes upon um this guy who's like a like a vagabond sort of a guy, but it turns out he's he's a famous uh outlaw. So he befriends this man. They have they're having cigarettes and cigars and food, and they're kind of staying in this shabby place. And he describes to him about this woman that he has met, Carmen. She that she one time she was fascinated by his watch. He takes her in, and she also was really good with. She could read your fortune with cards. I guess maybe tar- tarot cards or something along that line. And so she basically does this card reading for him, and she's very beautiful, very earthy. She's kind of hilarious. I mean, she's like a very lustful, lusty woman, and she d- gives him this his reading. And he's his fortune, his fortune. Thank you. And he is impressed with her. He thinks that she's basically saying like she or she, you know, she's she's predicting death, which is probably the easiest thing to predict because it'll happen to everybody. eventually. If there's one thing that's predictable, it's that you're falling in love, getting your dream job, those things. Okay, maybe not. But that would be like, yeah, that's going to happen. He meets a guy and this man is working at a cigar making place and Carmen is working there and Carmen's being and the guy is like the guard of the place to make sure everybody keeps working and Carmen has some kind of a girl fight with some other woman and carves an X on her like it gets really vicious Carmen gets it's it's quite a fight yeah yeah. they really they are fighting and um I forget what she says to the woman but yeah she carves an X in her face our outlaw Don Jose we find out he's he. We come to find out, like through the course of the novella, that um, Don Jose, who is a, a renowned, you know, again bandit outlaw, has a really bad reputation. Turns out he actually was like an honor guard kind of a guy. Like he was in the military, um, very well respected, and all of that. Until he crossed paths with Carmen, he was sent to arrest her after she carved this woman's face up and Carmen used her feminine wiles and her witchy woo woo powers on him and escaped. And now he's in trouble because he's had this prisoner escape and thus begins his road to being an outlaw himself. At some point, what's not in the other versions is that Carmen has a husband. Like she at at some point gets a husband, but that's right. I forgot. She's got a husband in the novella as well. Right. But she, but he, he cuts somebody like to get her and then he he falls in love with her and her whole thing is that people fall in love with her and she gets bored and she moves on and so she, like as soon as somebody says i love you i'm crazy about you she's like ah yeah i've heard that before and she's mm-hmm. she's on to the next guy the next mark whatever there's also a man named lucas that has a has a thing for her lucas is the one that's the toreador in the opera right or that, that character yeah. Yes. A bullfighter. Yep. Um, yeah. And so she falls for him. She just, she just, she just, yeah, she's all, she goes hither and yon with the wind. She's, she's never going to settle down with any one guy. Right. And he wants to say, look, leave this guy, leave your, your, leave your husband, leave him, come with me. We'll go to America. We'll start all over again. You can never own me. You can never possess me. Only I own me. Carmen will always be free because she has, because so then he's basically like, you know, if you, if you don't stay with me, I'm going to have to kill you because I can't let anybody have you. And, and he does, he does, he, by the way, we spoil the details. Yeah. Spoiler. (laughs) He stabs her to death. And then he, he buries her and then he leaves a marker and then he goes into town and basically says, 
I killed her. I guess I'm going to be hanged now. And a bunch of people get garroted, they call that, but that's basically being hanged. It's, you know, being your neck is blocked off and you're choked, you're, you're whatever. Anyway, so she's this very, like I said, earthy, sexy, sexual woman who just like gets men and then she moves to the next one and she moves on to the next one and she moves on to the next one. As soon as somebody is incredibly in love with her, she's bored and she just laughs in their face. She mocks them. It's a lot of that of just, you know, laughing at men who say, I, I will die without you. Finally, one of them is like, I'm just going to have to kill you because I can't take this. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not a solution. No. <laughs> I think we can agree. <laughs> but um, but anyway, s- that's the story. Yeah, but I can see why the, like, yeah. it's a basic idea is great. It's just, it's about, you know, you get a sexy woman and you get a bunch of guys fall in love with her and they're all a bunch of saps. And and this is what film noir becomes eventually, but this is sort of the beginning of it. The femme fatale, as we would say. And, oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, we have, we have, so we have an, uh, a French... Well, he's French, but he's a very international kind of an author. Mm -hmm. And he is writing a story that takes place in a place that he is not from. So, you know, it's a Frenchman's lens on Spanish culture and also Romani culture. So he's, you know, there's a lot of like, this is an old gypsy saying kind of thing throughout the whole book over and over and over again with lots of footnotes about explaining these like little colloquialisms, supposedly. Um but, uh, you know, it's a very compelling book. I mean, super, you know, super entertaining. Yeah, it's a quick read. Well written. Yeah, it's well yeah. written. It's a quick read. He's obviously very intelligent. I like the stuff he talked about, like the, the different accents that are in Spanish and that uh, is it Castilian, where you, you speak with your... Yeah, I've never sorted that out. Mexicans don't do that. We don't, right. We don't do the Lithby thing. Um, I never know, like what gets lisped and what does not and right. why. I have never decoded that but um but yeah he does kind of touch on it in the book a little bit right and so they're just talking about there's andalusia and then there's basque and there's just all these different sections of places in spain and then just throughout europe itself and that's basically the story and operas are meant are are, love these kinds of stories because it's huge themes it's a basic plot but it's about death and sex and people being in love and being people being jealous and so that the the opera comes out the opera is very fa- the music is very very like dun 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 da da oh everybody dun. isn't uh yeah the bad news bears remember the bad yes, news bears the bad like news they bears. used the music Gilligan's from Gilligan's Island <laughs> used it remember that Gilligan <laughs> they did Shakespeare everybody knows it every you all know these songs and I remember I put in the Facebook group that Katarina Vitt used Carmen when she won her oh I forgot in, about that in figure skating she was that's at, right she was so beautiful she was she oh she was phenomenal yeah so that's the basic story. And then what happens is in 1943, Oscar Hammerstein II says, let's take all of that, but we'll make it an African-American cast, all black cast. We'll set it in the 1940s in the South at an army base, but we'll keep the opera operatic style of singing, but we'll put in colloquial language what we would call a black set now, which he try it's a exactly what it is. Yes, yeah. well said. Yes, that is exactly you know, and 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 not this is not the first time. No, at this point we've already had Porgy and Bess. Yeah, yeah. so just as just I mean, in just somewhat the, the same way that that the original story is a Frenchman's take on a Spanish and Romany story. This is adding this additional layer. Of, of cultural appropriation right. on top of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are a lot of really cringy uh, moments with the the lyrics. I mean, I think the, the, the most kind of the biggest problem with this is, is definitely the lyrics. It's definitely Mr. Hammerstein um, and his his lyrics that he's come up with for this timeless music. Um, yeah. Yeah, but the story I think actually really works very well. Oh, sure. You know, the I'm... way they've trans uh, transferred the setting to World War II, uh, I think is actually I think that's pretty cool. I was really into that part of it. So one of the criticisms in the reviews was that it's a very weird criticism, but just that 
it's all black people everywhere, including the street scenes, including, and I'm like, well, it's a black military <laughs> like that base. that could never happen. <laughs> right, exactly. And you're in Chicago. So. And then it's Chicago, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the army was segregated at the time. You would have a place where it was just an African-American base and they, they yeah. make the parachutes it's north carolina i believe and they make parachutes yeah there it's a parachute factory which i think again i think works very well yeah. we have all of our same characters which i think you know transferred okay so just setting the scene you know we're talking it's set in world war ii and then we'll talk about how that translates into Let's the movie the version you know what margo let's do an ad break and then we'll play the trailer and then we'll go right into sensational long-run Broadway musical hit by Oscar Hammerstein, who gave you Showboat, Oklahoma, South Pacific, and The King and I. Brought to the screen by Otto Preminger, who produced and directed such hits as Laura and The Moon is Blue. With the original Bizet music that made Carmen one of the most popular scores in the world. With a cast of show world favorites starring Harry Belafonte, Dorothy Dandridge, Pearl Bailey, Olga James, Joe Adams, with a new modern story of the exciting people and colorful places of America. What's mine's yours, Joey. And that goes right down the line. You take us to Chicago, show us a good time. What we got to do for well, it? Don't ask him that now, honey. Let's get to Chicago first. So you run out, honey. Sure. I can give you a better time than I can. Fancy clothes. Swell company. The whole works. Husky Miller's latest woman. Only that ain't the way it's gonna be. I swear that no man take you away from me. How are you gonna stop me? I'll show you. I was going to say that I think that uh, we, we should probably talk a little bit about. So so tell me a little. I didn't quite. I could find much about the original stage version of this. Yeah. Um, were they singing opera? They were. So I did find. Oh, interesting. I looked up the old playbill. You can get all the old playbills online. That was a consistent criticism that it's. I mean, it it's. It's just different than what your expectations are. Opera singing is different than Broadway singing, than show tune singing, than pop singing, than rock singing. It's just its own animal. And either you like yeah. it or you don't. And either you raised... I, my parents listen to it, so I'm used to it. It doesn't bother... You know, classical music and opera doesn't bother me. Some people... But it's a very... Yeah, some thing. people just can't hear it. Yeah, right. And that's and it takes a specific talent. If you talk to people, I know people who are opera singers are trained. They don't sing pop music. They can't sing Happy Birthday. They don't sing anything because they only can kind of sing in this style. So finding a Broadway cast where everyone can sing in this particular style was challenging. But they did sing it. But they did it. Yes. So obviously it's not so beyond the pale that it's like, you can't believe it. You're looking at it. I don't get that. I don't either. I honestly think that's part of the problem. I think they should have turned it down a little bit and made it a little more, sh you know, show tuny. <gasps> well, sort of like Porgy and Bess does. Right. You know, where you have, um, I mean, not, I'm not saying that there's no problems there, but, no, <laughs> but, no. but in terms of just the actual musical style of it, Porgy and Bess does have these kind of classical overtones to it, but it's not like full opera. Right. Like this is. Right. But I still think it works. I still think musically, I mean, the the music, it's the musical. I mean, it's the, it's the opera. So how could it not work? Cause it's, it already works. <laughs> it was already an opera already with an that opera. music. It was already, it was a very successful musical, by the way, this happened. It opened in December of 1943 and it closed in the spring of 1945. That's a really good run. 
for Broadway. And they did say... Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. And the cast did say that it was a challenge. I think it was more of a mix at the time. Versus here, we have Otto Preminger, who was presented... He saw the musical and said that was the problem for him. He thought it it wasn't operatic enough that they they needed to... Oh, interesting. Right. So he thought... Okay. So he changed the story around a little bit from the play. It's mostly there. We have our... We just don't have the husband, but it's set in North Carolina. Let's go through the cast. We have Harry Belafonte as Joe. How beautiful. This cast. Oh, my That cast is outstanding. It's, this is such a solid cast. I... I was watching everybody's a, great oh they i was watching a, a documentary about you know biography remember any biography they did one on dorothy dandridge and dorothy dandridge and harry belafonte had a mad affair for like a year and then broke up can you imagine any well they are sizzling i mean my god yeah you could tell so we, dorothy dandridge is our carmen jones which is, which is the most important part of the movie and Otto Preminger thought she wasn't sexy enough that she had to come in all dressed up for him he's German he's a very stern guy uh, if you watch the Halle Berry movie introducing Dorothy Dandridge you get the idea about him he like things his own way Pearl Bailey as Frankie she does her own singing so great which I think was a nice touch to keep her she could sing in the in Milieu. Oh, well they all can sing I mean Dorothy yes. Dandridge could sing Harry and so, so of course could Harry Belafonte yeah right. but they weren't opera singers you know it's a whole like you were saying it's a completely different kind of set of skills Tell you why I wanna dance. It ain't the sweetness in the music. I like the sweetness in the music, <laughs> but that ain't why I wanna dance. It's something thumping in the bass. That thump thump thumping on the music. That bump bump bumping on the music is all I need to start me off. I don't need nothing else. Maybe I do to start me on. Beat out that rhythm on a drum. Beat out that rhythm on a drum. Beat out that rhythm on a drum. And I don't need no tune at all. Beat me that rhythm on a drum. Beat me that rhythm on a drum. Beat me that rhythm on a drum. And I don't need no tune at all. But the, I liked that they had the decision to keep Pearl Bailey's voice. I thought was the right move. Her segment with the drums is so good. So good. Wow. And I remember I put it in the Facebook group. Guys, I remember as a kid, she did those Nestle's commercials, the commercials for cookies. Yeah. <laughs> Look at these chips. I, I love Pearl Bailey. Me too. We have the same birthday. But she, her perform. Oh, really? Yes, March 29th. Oh, <laughs> her performance of that number is electric yes so good and she does her singing. it's brilliant we should say yeah. that laverne hutchinson did the singing for harry belafonte and marilyn horn did the singing for halle berry and a few other women diane carroll i believe or that was bernice peterson brock peters mm-hmm. was a singer like brock peters plays Sarge, sergeant brown but he also sang for himself and then dubbed other people this is for me well let me, let me finish this olga james is cindy lou She's sort of this innocent that Joe is going to marry that day. He's going to be about to ship off to war. And he's yeah. this innocent 18-year-old. Just beautiful. And then he has Husky Miller is this boxer that's in Chicago. And he has the major hearts for Carmen. Carmen gets into a fight at the plant, at the the place where they're doing the parachute. So Joe has to take her to jail or prison he and he was supposed to get married that day like that was this whole thing he was gonna do with his downtime and and Carmen was like oh no no I've got other plans they're in a jeep together it's very sexy they're you know she's really laying on the charm uh this is also by Diane Carroll is he here her first movie? it's her f- debut film she is so adorable in this movie as cute as a button I'm telling you she and Joe have this fling and they're in this jeep 
and then they get f- and it's like a green screen and then all of a sudden they get flung from the jeep and it's really happening like they did their own yeah. stunts it's yeah she gets there, it's up very outfit. physical yes it th- that scene is so so physical for both of them yes. it's quite impressive yeah maybe they're not the ones jumping from the jeep but all the other stuff is all, them yeah it's all of that quite, is them. quite something right and then he of course falls in love with her she does the card reading or her grandmother does the card reading and it says death is at the door. Carmen is playing the whole game of like, no, 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 but yes, yes, yes. They get together and they wind up in this flea bag in Chicago or is it in town? Yes, he's he is now on the run right. because because he, he let his prisoner just like in the opera, he let his prisoner get away. And he's now AWOL as well. Yeah. So he's really in trouble. Yeah. He really can't even like go outside. Um, so he is now completely helpless. He, he completely dependent on Carmen for absolutely everything. And that is not a position that she is enjoying very much. No, he's very needy and he's hanging around this sleazy hotel where there's not even a TV or a radio. And he's just kind of stuck there. So she's like, oh, I'm going to go out and get some food. And he's, you don't have any you know, money. Well, I'll figure it out. She runs into some friends and they're friends with this boxer. And he's like the Mike Tyson of the time. He's the this very charismatic man who's like huge and and just could punch you know lay anybody out and he has the hots for Carmen and she's got a couple of friends that are in his friend circle and he makes it very clear if you bring Carmen with you we'll all party together but Carmen has Joe so she's got to get rid of Joe and so because she's like I'm not starving for this guy I'm going to gonna have some fun well you know well you have a chance goes on who plays him husky miller joe adams very good yeah he was is he the one that he was uh uh ray charles manager i you know what oh is that the movie with jamie Fox? no no for real no i mean in real really? life i don't know yeah I let know. me look i'll look look it up i hear he was a dj before he did this his voice is dubbed by marvin hayes but they get together and there's like a great, I like actually the scene where they're getting on the choo-choo train and they're going to go up to Chicago. That was really fun because it used to take like half a day to, to do stuff like that. They go to Chicago. They're having this great time. And then Harry Belafonte sees her. She's like rising up because this man is making a load of money being this world champion. But they're at the <laughs> match. Yeah. Meanwhile, I guess Harry Belafonte has been like cooped up in that gross room for the whole time <laughs> just like waiting for her to come back or something he's very squirrely he go- so he goes to the match and and carmen is there and she's in furs and diamonds and everybody and dorothy dandris is so beautiful is just so charismatic the camera loves her she just looks amazing in every scene that she's in he notices her and then he tries to drag her away from some from husky miller and he gets her into like a closet area, like the, just outside. And he's mad and he's yelling at her and he's saying, you know, I love you. Come with me. And she's like, get out of here. Go on with your life. I'm, I'm no, you know, yeah. this isn't going to work. And he strangles her to death. And then he sings and then he's saying goodbye to her because he knows now he's going to get he's going to get the electric. He's chair. like, yeah, curtains for me. Curtains. Yeah. Hugsy. Sometimes I found the lip syncing a little distracting. Me too. It does get a little distracting in places. Um, oh, Joe Adams, by the way, Joe Adams. Yes. This jockey, and he was he was uh, yeah he plays the fighter slash Toreador um, 
uh, Husky Miller. He, uh, yeah, he was Ray Charles' manager, and oh. he was the he Joe Adams was the first African American to win a Golden Globe. Wow! What did he win it yeah. for? Let me find out. It does not say. No. <laughs> <laughs> you would think that like you're kind of burying the lead here. Well, I'll say that Dorothy you Dandridge was the first African American woman nominated for Best Actress for the Academy Awards the following year. She is the first African American woman to be on the cover of Life magazine when magazines were a very big deal. She was also nominated for a Golden Globe for Porgy and Bess that happens a few years later. But in this time, Dorothy, by the way, backstage, she's having a mad affair with the director, Otto Preminger. He's married, and she was, this is very sad, she was married to one of the Nichols brothers. Nicholas brothers? The, yeah. And yeah, Nicholas brothers. Her husband uh, was a womanizer. She was very young. She was like 18 or 19. She was very young when she married him, but um, she, he was a womanizer, and he loved golf, and she was pregnant she was about to give birth like her water broke she was in a lot of pain and he took the car and went golfing and said i'll be back you're not going to be due for a while what the they think happened is that the baby uh was starved of oxygen by the time she was able to get to the hospital and so she was born developmentally disabled and at that time they just put kids in homes there was they didn't know what to do for them so dorothy's just a couple years away from that and she and she grew up in show business she had um her mother later became an actress and did very well for herself she was on a lot of like black theater but dorothy uh this the story always is with her like she had this tragic upbringing and then she just man every man let her down she always was finding trying to find someone she to save really oh and she, yeah. she, within 10 years of this movie, she dies. And it's from overdose of pills, plus I think a blood clot thing that happened. She had like an injury, but she was only like 42 when she passed yeah. away, which is just tragic. <sighs> and it's tragic it is. because she is, she could sing and she had a lovely voice. She really had a beautiful voice. Yeah. She did. It's not an operatic voice, but it's no. an awfully nice voice. And I love, we all know how Harry Belafonte sounds. So it would have been nice to just let them do their thing. I don't know. Otto Preminger was very strict about it. So they had like, I guess like they showed the movie that a record player and she had to just sort of lip sync to the record. I mean, she does. A- amazing. You still, you can't take your eyes off of her. Still, she's performing the booty off of these songs. Um, there was something I wanted to say. Oh, so so the movie, is, I mean, the, the story, the musical of Carmen Jones. So it's set during World War II. World War II, we have segregated units yes. fighting, you know, so you have all black units. There's nothing implausible about this at all in this right. regard. Um, and certainly Chicago. <laughs> What? I mean, we talked about passing, you know, yes. we have photographic. We know that that's right. Yeah. It's anyway, um, the movie, however, th- we're not going back to 1940s fashion for this movie. <laughs> it's not sexy enough. So the fashions are very, very 1950s, although we are still it's not implausible, you know, right. but it's um, it is definitely a sexier I mean, for one thing, the um, I, th- I think didn't they like ration fabrics? And so, you know, yes, for, the during 40s. the right. So so things changed dramatically during the war. Anyway, uh, the fashions are gorgeous. The yeah. costumes are just jaw droppingly beautiful. I, I like all the set designs and everything. Um, I did find <sighs> my big thing was not so much the lip syncing, which, again, I think everybody particularly the two leads mm-hmm. performed so well. All everybody performed all of the lip yes. syncs extremely well. The dancing is phenomenal. What I didn't like, and again this is Mr. Hammerstein, um is you know the the again the black scent, the yeah. you know, that for instance the scene where Carmen gets her fortune read and she uh she gets the death card and she says she says, she speaks, Dorothy Dandridge's voice says, it's the nine of spades. And then in the next breath, she lip syncs, it's the nine of spades. Like, must we? There's a song called It's a lot of diss and dem. You is my man. Yeah. There's, I mean. <sighs> there's one, dat love. That's the first thing that she sings when she's there. And then yeah. you talk just like my ma. 
Uh, it's so awkward the way that they disflower. It's, yeah. Um, it's not great. Um, really? Yeah. That's the time. Look, it was in the 40s. He wrote it. And maybe it was progressive for the t- I don't know. They didn't. There was. It was actually. Uh, so the movie studio did not want to do it at first, of course, because they're just like, this is just going to lose us money. What's the point? And uh, Preminger was like, I want to do this movie. I'll do it independently if I have to. And then somebody turned around and said, no, these kids are really sexy. I'm sure it'll play well in the big cities. And then he had to have the script approved. And it, they had a couple. And it was funny, he said, because I gave they said that she was too sexy. She was too because also there's that whole layer of just an African American couple, you know, can embrace and it's seen as so having sexual. a relationship, right? It's seen as so much more sexual that doesn't involve white people at all. Right? We can't have that. We can't see lust. We can't see you know the bra straps. I mean, there's just all kinds of things we can't see. So he said that he gave different options, and everyone they picked the racier one and then he also had to run it by the NAACP and the NAACP was totally fine with it because Harry Belafonte didn't want to do it at first. He was like, because he he did regret doing Porgy and Bess later. You mean Carmen Jones? Yeah. Well, I mean, he didn't regret, but didn't he, who was in Porgy and Bess? Was Harry Belafonte in Porgy and Bess? He might have been. Let me see. There's, because I know that she was on there. Do, 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 Harry Belafonte. National treasure, Harry Belafonte. 95 years old, by the way. Still with us. He refused. Okay, no, no, no. He was offered. It came after okay. Carmen Jones, and he was offered the role, but he turned it down because of his experience with Carmen Jones. Thank you. Um, Sorry, guys. We just so wanted just to, to get our facts straight. Yeah, just, just to set the scene um, with, again, with this movie coming out, we're talking about... 1954, at the very beginning of the civil rights movement, it's the same year that Brown versus Board of Education mm-hmm. um, raps. So a lot of things, you know, are about to change in American society. They haven't yet. Um, it's still very much a, a right after the World War II. You know, World War II is very, very recent. Everybody, it's in everybody's recent memory. Mm-hmm. You know, but we haven't had the civil rights era just, you know, it's just right. in its. It hasn't really gotten its momentum just yet. One of I just want to mention one of my favorite books um, that I read recently in recent years, probably in the last five years, is a book. Um, I, mean, I want to make sure I get the title right. It's Michael Eric Dyson, mm-hmm. and it's called What Truth Sounds Like. And it is about um, it takes place in 19. 19- 63 I think um and it's about this historic meeting that Robert Kennedy called he Robert Kennedy has a, a point maybe an epiphany you might want to call it um you know at this point he's attorney general to his brother and he realizes you know we need to get involved in in this civil rights movement and something has got to happen and so he Try he calls this sounds really terrible. He calls James Baldwin, writer James Baldwin, and says basically, like, get all your can you cut can you come to the White House and bring all of your, you know, like most famous black friends with you? You all know each other. So so you can tell me about <laughs> tell me about black people and and what we what what we're supposed to, you know, what we're supposed to do with us. So if I can probably I remember everybody who showed up. So James Baldwin is like, I don't know, man. And so he finally agrees to do it. And he shows up with Harry Belafonte and Lorraine Hansberry. Oh, I'm not remembering everybody. But anyway, so they show up. And instead of being like what it's, it sounds like what Kennedy was envisioning was like, I don't know. What do you want it, A slideshow? I don't know. Right. But what happened, what he got was a real dressing down and um, they just let him have it. And they did not uh, pull any punches. They were really direct about what was going on and what had been going on and why it was going on and what are you going to do about it? And why haven't you done anything? You said you were going to do this and you didn't. And you said you were going to do that. And we haven't seen anything. And it was like, it really changed Robert Kennedy. It really changed his whole perspective on civil rights and what it meant and what it means to be an ally was what we would say today. Right. Uh, Really, it's a 
fascinating book. I, it's not a long read. I strongly, strongly recommend it. Um, and there's a really great part about, you know, Harry, Harry Belafonte and, and what he was, um, what his contribution to that night was. He was very, he was one of those people, like my grandmother was very racist, grew up uh, in a family that had slaves back when people had slaves. That's That was her background. She was one of those people that say he was a credit to his race. That was like their her highest compliment for people. Yeah. And he heard yeah. that, I'm sure, all the time. They're like, oh, you're so eloquent. And, and, and every, I know. He served in the American War. Like a lot of what people don't realize is that they're sending in this. It's a segregated base that this is happening. That's why you don't see any white people there. When they're sent overseas, they're segregated. When they fight yeah. for America, they come back. They're still segregated. Yes. Even with the GI Bill. You Even know? when they were filming this movie. Yes. <laughs> Dorothy Dandridge could not, she was a performer who was not allowed to walk through the lobby of the hotel that she performed at in Las Vegas at this time. She couldn't use the bathrooms. She couldn't swim in the pool. She was told, you swim in this pool, we'll have to drain it. That's how she was treated at this time. So this is all very important. I mean, and the fact that this movie, they made it for under a million and it made 10 million is a big deal. But also, we've talked about this over and over again. Every once in a while, you think Hollywood's going to change. Something happens and they just go, ah, that was an anomaly. That just, that was a lucky yeah. break. And they just stick with the when schedule. When in fact, all, they've made sure that it is an anomaly. Yeah, right. they've done everything they can to make it that a reality. Right. Um, I think the film is excellent. Yeah. I think, um, you know, again, my only beef with it is the lyrics, mm -hmm. which I think are very terrible. But I, yes. but I, I, but the music, of course, is wonderful music. Of course it is. Loves a baby that grows up wild And he don't do what you want him to Loving nobody's angel child And he won't pay any mind to you One man gives me his diamond stud And I won't give him a cigarette One man treats me like I was mad and all I got that man can get That's love That's love You go for me and I'm taboo But if you're hard to get I go for you And if I do then you are through I think it is an apt adaptation of that story. Mm -hmm. I think it, it translates extremely well to the United States in that era. I think it's a brilliant way because, again, um, you know, if you're looking at the source material, the Romani have always been a marginalized community. And they certainly were in Spain at the time that the story is set. Yes. In the original source material. So it, it, it so for that reason alone, I think it translates super, super well. Uh, and the cast how can you argue with that cast? It's, the choreography, yeah. oh, it's just brilliant. Yeah, it, it's gorgeous, and like you said, the set de the set design, the costumes are just you just it's fun. it's very believable, and it, it it's yeah. I think that was my Nick picky. It's the lip syncing, and like you said, because I watch everything with the 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 captions, so I was like, yeah, me too. I was wincing when I, I know. Saw Ooh, like, oh, ouch! It's even worse when you read them, isn't it? <laughs> really bad it really kind of hits you over the head with it a white man trying to translate you know but it was it's like what did you do what was the i want to know the research you did for this but what did you do exactly yeah did he go to north carolina and just hang out at coffee shops maybe i i don't know i but you know sometimes broadway did he go to oklahoma i don't know <laughs> yeah but, you know, it was a big success at the time. It's an interesting interpretation. Like you said, I think it's clever. I think it's a good idea. It's just like... I do think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think it's 10 years yeah. after it was on Broadway. And like you said, within five years, everything's going to change. It's 
everything. The 60s changes everything. But so, so it's sort of this, the cuss. Harry Belafonte is still with us. He's 95 years old, just had his birthday. Everybody else pretty much is gone. Dorothy had an affair with Otto Preminger, the director, and it was very open. You know, he and his wife had an open relationship at the time, that wife he had at the time, excuse me, but they couldn't be seen together in America. They, you know, overseas in Paris and London, they could do whatever they wanted. Not because he was married. No, (laughs) not because he was married. It was because it was interracial. That's like, he was German. He spoke with the accent and everything. He became very controlling of her and then told her after that she can only take starring roles. And she was offered really interesting things. She wanted to be an actress. She was like, singing was fun, but she really was, she studied with Ava Gardner and Marilyn Monroe. I mean, she's fantastic. She's really, really good. She is. It's, It's just sad to say she had these series of disappointments and, you know, unlike Carmen, who ate all the men and was like dominating over the men, it's like men in her life dominated her and made her miserable. And I, I always hate that story because I just think, ugh, yeah, it's such a waste. I know it is a waste. It is a waste. Just it's it, alone. yeah. <laughs> we could have had, you know, years of her. I know she could have done. Yeah. She could be like Lena Horn. She could have been, you know, doing. Yeah. Because I mean, she her just. I mean, it's shallow to say, but just her beauty alone, those cheekbones, I mean, those legs. I know. <laughs> it's true. But she, it, you know, this performance, and it is, I mean, it's it's such a good performance. First of all, she's got, she's got quiet scenes, you know, where she's got all kinds of stuff going on. She's got extremely physical scenes. Mm-hmm. And then she's performing these songs. Um, you know, she's moving the story along. She's performing these really terrible lyrics, but she, you know, you're buying it because she's performing it so, so well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, there are so many levels to the, I mean, of course, everybody, rec- I mean, even, even at the time, people couldn't deny it. what an amazing performance it is, okay. um, how many layers and nuances there are. And, and yet it's so big and operatic. It's terrific. Yeah. So which do you like more? <laughs> oh, I know, right? Oh, because I really did like the novella, actually. I did, too. I, I, I was surprised how much I liked it. I was a little bit, like, preparing myself, like, oh, boy, here we go. But actually, I, I enjoyed it quite a lot. You know, I just love seeing Harry Belafonte and, yeah. and uh, Dorothy. And the and Cindy Lou. Cindy Lou. She's adorable. Is, what a role. But she was, I mean, she's, again, really, really performing these songs really delivering them yeah. uh, so that you really buy that character. And the songs are not good. I mean, the music's beautiful, but the songs are not her, her lyrics are maybe the worst of all. Right. And, um, but you really buy it because she's performing it so beautifully. So yeah, I'm going to give it to the movie. I'm actually going to do it too. As much as I complained about that stuff, I think, cause I'll definitely watch this again. I don't know if I'll read the book again, Me too. But, but I'm glad I, Me too. I'm glad I checked out and I thank him for saving Carcassonne, one of my favorite places, the writer, the author writer. So, we give it to the movie. And then we have Now do we have one more for March? One more we have left. Okay, so Have you ever seen Phantom the Musical? Never. Wow, I've seen it several times. Is it good? It's it's pretty good. You know when you see it on stage, it's it's impressive. I saw it in London and I saw it in New York. But didn't they make a movie Gerard movie? Butler, oh my god. I thought so. Okay, so we've decided, we were just chit-chatting off the air, we are going to cover for the last one for the month, Phantom of the Opera. We did talk about Phantom of the Opera before, but we compared it to the silent film. This time we're going to compare it to the movie that stars Gerard Butler, and so that's in 2004, that movie came out and it is streaming. I'm super excited, Margot. Me too, because we haven't done an Andrew Lloyd Webber. No, this uh, this we musical last march. Year. Last time we did Cats, we did Cats. Um, which everybody hated, including Andrew Lloyd Webber. But this time we're going to be talking about Phantom. That will be very fun. That'll be awesome. Okay, so please follow us on all the places. We're always looking for suggestions for books and movies. We use song titles, magazine articles, plays. I'm starting to do a list of plays that we can probably cover. All that stuff, just uh, novellas. Just send us your ideas on social media. Once again, our email is book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. If you would like some stickers or magnets, send us an email. We'll drop them in the mail for you. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? 
You can find me at Brooklyn Fit Chick for Twitter and Instagram. My site is brooklynfitchick.com. Thank you all so much. And we will be back soon with a new episode. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Book Versus Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcast. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book Versus Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book Versus Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book Versus Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show, and we'll be back soon with a new episode.